very impromptu kind of live discussion about um, Shadowrun 5th edition, or I guess kind of any Shadowrun kind of thing. Like, this is kind of going the concepts in the world of Shadowrun, so this would work if we are probably using any other editions. I'm not sure how crunchy so in terms of rules we'll be getting, but um, this is going to be about kind of designing a run. We have uh, three uh, GMs here, myself included, and from novice to experienced. Um, and I guess we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, you know me, I... I'm in a lot of videos, and if you haven't seen the videos that I'm in, check out the channel. There's plenty of them. And we also have Mr. Johnson, or not Bob. Yo, I'm in a few videos. Uh, I've been GMing for the last two and a half years, and year, yeah, the last year I've been basically doing all Shadowrun all the time. So I like to think I know my stuff a little bit. What are the stuff you were doing before Shadowrun 5th? Uh, mostly uh, 40k role plays like Dark Heresy and Only War. Okay. So very high lethality. Yep. And stupid, ridiculous fantasy. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then we have Nick, or whatever you want to call yourself. <laughs> I can just go with Nick. Um, and, yeah, I've been I've uh, run a Shadowrun campaign in the past several months, and um, I've been playing tabletop games for years before this, but I haven't really consistently done any GMing. Um, no. all of um, Tom's group here in uh, real life so I've learned a lot yeah, you started, we started at the same time from 40k we didn't play any 40k games but we started playing role playing games because of 40k and I think it's 5 years now so woo about, yeah so yeah, it's about that. 3.5 so yeah, started with 3.5 and then moved on to many different systems uh, and then finally to 5th edition where we are now, but we, other, we play other systems as well. But we'll be just talking about 5th edition and this is probably mainly for the GMs. So, But I mean, if you're a player who wants to look into GMing, this is definitely for you at least because the hardest part, apart from actually GMing, is designing the run. Now, you could just run something out of an adventure, and that's probably pretty good for newbies. Um, I've actually never actually ran a published adventure of Shadowrun. Have you? Yeah. Uh... No, I, I re I'm not a big fan of um, doing other people's runs because I feel like mm -hmm. I make sh stuff up on the fly and that works a lot better than just having this happens and this happens and this happens. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the only time I run other people's runs is generally for horror stuff because uh, I am not a horror writer so and I'm not very good at horror, but I could run horror if you give me a good adventure. <laughs> How about yourself, Nick? Have you? No, you definitely haven't, have you? Ran out a published adventure for Shadowrun. I've ran, yeah, I've ran published adventures for Pathfinder, but never for Shadowrun. Never. And uh, I prefer doing things on the fly and doing my own stupid shit because, uh, I mean, at least most GMs, at least from what I know, like to do stupid shit, run their own thing because you have creative agency and freedom and you're the GM, so you kind of deserve that stuff. So this is going to be, I guess, podcasty discussion thing so that there's no real visuals going on. So. I mean, you can kind of watch this another window uh, or whatever. So I guess we'll kind of start with, um, you know, like Shadowrun can be pretty difficult to GM. I guess Do, can you guys uh, contest to that? Do you think that's true? That statement. No contest. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty difficult. Um, there's a lot of stuff you have to keep track of, just like mm -hmm. mechanically, and then you've got to keep it thematically, and it's a juggling act, and you basically but, have to know everyone's rules because. 90% of the time, they might not. Mm, and that is that is the biggest thing that scares people away from Shadowrun jamming, and that's why, at least in our home group, I was Shadowrun jamming for the longest time. Like Most of my players still would be too scared to do it, or at least uh, often. Um, but it's the thing is, at the same time, it's not as hard as you think. Like If you have a decent grasp, and you can make a character pretty quickly, and you can, you've played every single type, you can probably run Shadowrun. You know, it's not that hard, but at the same time, it is. It's like, I don't want to scare people away, but at the same time, be warned. Because I, I think the biggest thing is, is that with any mission, there are three levels of security that you have to think about. Magic, physical, and the matrix, and how they work together. And ultimately, the whole world as well, and all the lore, and what's appropriate, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> it gets well over your head. I think the scariest part about DMing for Shadowrun is that if you're doing DMing, say, D&D... Every, almost every character in d and is a combat character, so they can all fight and they can all kill. In Shadowrun, um, there's a good chance half of your party can't do that. They're going to be hackers, there's going to be faces, 
and you have to think of ways to occupy those people when they aren't doing you know the most lengthiest part of the game combat. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's wildly debatable. I mean, the Matrix can get pretty drawn out. Ah, oh, yeah, good point. Nagging. <laughs> yeah, hacking. And usually it only engages one player, while uh, the, when the face is talking, maybe another player will be engaged as well, but with the face. So, um, I mean, hacking is probably the worst, because it's, it's not as long as Astral, because usually there will be little to nothing to do in Astral. Like, you see some shit, you might have to fight some spirits, run away, that kind of thing. But hacking, it can get ridiculous, oh. depending on what Matrix security is. Yeah, it gets it's get uh, intense is is the word I would use for it. Mm-hmm. And because there's a lot of rules, a lot of actions, and ugh. trust me, if you're going to be going in as, as a hacker or as a player, and your whole table is not new, make sure that you know the rules well, or at least the GM knows it and is willing to help you play your character. Because yeah. um, I've I've heard of some problems where people come into a game and they expect the GM to play their character for them, and the GM will doesn't want to. So you got to make sure that everything's okay. But I'm telling you right now, in one of my games, I do not care if you know nothing about the Matrix. I'll help you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's come a long way from the first edition game where you carry around a surfboard size cyber deck to try and hack into a mini game. But um, it, it's still there. It's it's a part of Shadowrun's DNA, and it's probably going to be impossible to really kind of get that little bit out. Unless oh, you need the hacking though, because that's all do. cyberpunk, man. Yeah. Get rid of the hacking, and I'll throw a fucking book at you or some shit. Because I love the hacking; it's fun, um, and you have so much power as a hacker. Oh, but... the the, the uh, caveat: the more the GM knows about the Matrix, the more powerful you are. The more the GM knows about magic, the less powerful you are. That is an old saying that I've heard thrown around many times, and it's very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I actually remember once I had a player that actually knew about networking and stuff, and because, at least how I run rules, if it makes sense in the real world, I let it happen. He was one of the best deckers I've ever seen, because <laughs> he just knew what he was doing. He barely knew the rules, but he knew networking. So, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, study networking, and you'll become a good decker. Yep, it's true. <laughs> Now study wizardry. Yeah, and you become a good mage. All right, confirmed. All right, end, end, end of discussion. See you later, guys. No. In all seriousness, though, I guess we'll kind of talk about like actually running the game and stuff now that we've kind of introduced it a bit. Um, I guess we'll kind of talk about the types of runs because when you before you go into a run, you have to kind of decide what are they going to be doing. And um, there are a few basic run types, um, and I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but at least most of them. I know there's there's breaking and entering, which most run types will have this in some regard, but breaking and entering is just that's what you're doing. You're going in usually either kidnapping someone or taking something. That can also be like part of the extraction type thing and then getting it out. Um, the breaking and entering is less about the journey there and back. It's just about getting in. So the thing that you're taking, you're not going to be followed or anything like that unless you fuck it up badly. It is the um, classic Shadowrun art, like archetypal mission where you the whole squad goes into the Megacorp HQ and you've got to get the Decker on site and he's got to do the data steal and then ah oh, suddenly security sprints out of everywhere and you've got to shoot your way out. That breaking and entering yeah. is just mm. yeah. Data steal is the like quintessential kind of run or stealing either a small physical object. As soon as it it starts to become large, the B&E becomes about something else. It becomes less about actually breaking and entering. It becomes about getting it out. And that's where it starts to become what I call an extraction, which is you're extracting something. This can be a person. This can be something rather large. But it's also about the running away. About the extraction is a big part of it as well, and getting without fucking being noticed, which is incredibly difficult in in extractions. (laughs) Yeah, especially if the thing you're extracting doesn't want to be extracted and is going, help, help, they're kidnapping me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that can I find chloroform works best in that situation. Uh, no rest on, but yeah. <laughs> then, of course, if you don't have a vehicle to transport it, they have to handle it. Oh, them. yeah, because the rigger forgot to show up and it's like, oh, who can drive? Whoops. Mm-hmm. Who's got a um, small truck? So what else are there some other types of runs, guys, apart from extractions and B&Es? Got anything else? Investigation. Um, yeah. Investigation. investigation. Yeah. The, the goal Find might not out be... About some... You just require, you know, really, really pinpoint information. 
um, yeah. I've seen so that this, quite like, well. Yeah, th these ones are actually really good for faces and deckers, and sometimes less so good for the characters that like to shoot things. Unless, of course, things go wrong. Then the guys that shoot things have a fucking great time. And it always will. Which it always will, because as a GM, it is your job to make sure things goes wrong. Things go wrong, which we'll talk about a little bit later. <laughs> it is your job for that to happen. <laughs> uh, sometimes, sometimes the players bring it on themselves, and and then you just sit back and say, "Well, you fucked up here." Well, you, you, well, what I'm talking about is the design. The design is that ultimately yeah. something is going to go wrong. Always throw in a curveball, and this is uh, incredibly important. When at least for me, for Shadow, have a have a twist. Have a curveball. Like maybe some of the information that you gave to the players was wrong, just blatantly wrong. The, G the Johnson got it wrong. He is sometimes the security has got like, sec more security than you expected. You, you thought there was just going to be two goons, but suddenly there's a full group of guys in Millspec walking around like they own the joint. Or the place that you're running against is also being broken in by another Shadowrun team. They fuck it up and the HDR gets cold. Not on you, but Ooh. on them. Classic. I've done that cool. before. One of your players isn't being honest. Sometimes the best twist is to just have no twist and see the player's paranoia spark up. Is the Johnson lying about this? Is this a bomb? Are we going to die? And then they get to the end of the meet and nothing has gone wrong. And that's when they start freaking out. <laughs> You've done that before, where um, they went to a meat spot and they were um, they're extracting someone, but this person was had been kidnapped. And they were taking her out, and this I think this was on the channel. And they went to the meat, and there were heaps of people there, right? And they freaked out, and they thought they were going to get double crossed. No, it was just the family of the girl. They were all there to watch her come back. That's all it was. <laughs> but everyone started freaking out and thinking they were getting double crossed. It was pretty funny. <laughs> and the samurai opens up with a machine gun, and then, oops! What a misunderstanding. Yeah, that's a really bad misunderstanding that's going to um, <laughs> end quite badly. Um, is there any more types of runs? I'm pretty sure there's some that we didn't really talk about there. Is there any more that we can kind of uh, gloss over to spark some Wet ideas? work. Yeah. Wet work is pretty big. Uh, shooting yep. people in the face for money. Uh, you're a cold-hearted bastard for doing it, but pays really well. Mm -hmm. yeah, that... yeah, and I mean, all missions also kind of have a little bit of wet work, a little bit of extraction, a little bit of being in it, really, anyway. Whether that be side missions or the nature of the job, you know, when you're doing wet work, you may have to break it into anyway, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm, and you'll probably have to <coughs> investigate security, all that kind of stuff. Well, another thing when you're looking at type of run also is that also steal things from other media. Um, I've done this quite a lot. Um, I have had a run that was based on fucking Payday, a run, a, like a job in oh. Payday the game. I have um, stolen so many of my runs from Payday. It is beautiful. Do not be afraid to steal from media because guess what? They stole it from something else as well. You know, by, uh, getting something from Ocean's Eleven or, you know, uh, James Bond, you know, spy movies and, you know, um, criminal movies and stuff like that are all awesome places for shit to get ideas for runs for. And they can be very strange and different because, well, they've been written by people that are getting paid thousands of dollars to write, so they're going to be a lot better than you, unless, of course, you're a great writer as well, but it's fine to steal and adapt it. Don't do this exactly the same, but um, what's some of the stuff that you guys have stolen in the past, at least um, Mr. Johnson, because I think you've run more than Nick. Um, <coughs> I've, I've done the mission uh, Safe House from Payday 1, where your entire mission is to bust into a gang's headquarters and then blow up their roof get a helicopter in to, like, lift out the safe room full of money. And basically what happened is they did that, and then they flew away riding on the um, safe house, shooting down helicopters. Uh, that that was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, off the top of my head... I've stolen a few themes, or I've just set it up just right. Um, you know the extraction scene from The Dark Knight where Batman's getting in his cape and he's on the big-ass tower in China and he's trying to take out the Chinese businessman who's funding the Joker, on, and, and he just shoots in through the window and then knocks the guy out and fights his way out um, that way? I've set that up in the Shadowrun. It came organically... But I, I gave the building blocks, and the runners just went, oh, what if we jump in through the other door? I mean, other building. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Yes. Uh, and 
I've shamelessly stolen stuff from Mad Max. Um, yeah, because I'm I mean, Nick, Nick has recently with his game. Is, uh, his yeah. game in Australia is just Mad Max when you go out of cities, which is great fun. I'm so keen for the uh, new Rigger book because they have the they basically have built the war rig in Shadowrun. Oh, no. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> That's amazing. Alrighty, so let's talk a little bit Talk about inspiration. Is there anything else you guys can kind of talk about for inspiration for types of runs or anything like that or anything in general? I find when I hit the what kind of run I want to build, and like I've just hit a brick wall, I find going to the classic cyberpunk genre and just getting back to the roots of the genre in general. So going to read, I reread like Gibson's Neuromancer, um, Blade Runner, uh, do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, um, playing uh, Shadowrun Returns. Uh, you know, it, it's the video game, but like it can still give you a lot of theme oh, and God, yeah. that stuff. And it's like, oh, I, re- I remember, I might make this into a run, twist it up a bit, and um. Yeah. Well, so quite, like quite quite recently I ran a run where they versed Jedi because of mm. the new spell that they created Jedi you can have Jedi fucking mind blades and yeah, um they cool. versed Jedi and it was fucking a very fun run. Everyone it was not a feel good had... run. <laughs> it was not a feel good run because the Jedi that they were versing were good guys um and you guys were working for rapists and criminals. <laughs> so, you know, path of the course. Yes, but it, I made it very apparent and obvious that these people were trying to save these people and you guys just killed them in cold blood. <laughs> well, put a gun to their face to like, get the get the hell out of here, and then they came back. So, okay, now nah, your chance is gone. <laughs> we're fine. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's fine what you guys did. Like, ultimately, it would have taken a very big heart for a Shadowrunner to turn down a mission like that. Alrighty. Anyway, so uh, let's move on from that and inspiration for the run. Um, once again, also just taking ideas from other people. Like you saw a cool run someone did and you thought of some changes, just do it. If you feel the need, ask the person if you can adapt it. Most people will be like, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. Or just do it anyway. Most people won't give a crap. Now, just if they're trying to like, publish the run them. and you publish it, that's that's probably where you definitely need to ask for permission, but that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about pub, uh, ideas anyway. Yeah, like if you um, if you run a like a convention game and you're like, wow, that one was really great. I'm gonna copy and paste that for my run over and in my home game. That's probably cool. Like no one will notice that you've lifted someone's ideas. And if you want to say, oh, I got this idea from a con game, they'll be like, cool. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, that's that. So I, I guess we'll kind of talk about a little bit more like when you're running, and the, the stuff you need to think of is a lot more than, say, a more traditional RPG, um, except for maybe modern. Like, if you're used to running modern and sci-fi, you'll be completely fine with Shadowrun. But in D&D and stuff like that, you don't have the ever-presence of the world so much interacting with the players as much as you would with Shadowrun. Because when Shadowrunners are doing a mission, they're not just thinking about what is the security in the building. They're thinking... Uh, is someone going to call the cops on us when they see us? How far away is the high threat response team? And this is like a ticking time bomb that's in every single Shadowrun run. And that's what makes Shadowrun run so difficult, is it's not the actual run itself, it's being caught and getting home safe. And this is what makes Shadowrun so much fun, because it's difficult and it's very, very deadly. So um, how do you guys kind of handle the HTR and stuff like that? And Do you use stuff from the book? Do you change stuff? Um, what do you guys do? So, for HDR, I usually have it as, okay, you've gone loud, someone's hit a panic button, the boop, 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 alarms have started, everyone's freaking out, um, and I will secretly roll time behind the GM screen and then mark it down and, like, put looming uh, threats in. Like, you hear sirens in the distance, you see a helicopter, like, take off from a nearby skyscraper and start moving towards you. You hear over the radios, we're sending in the high threat response teams. Um, trap the Shadowrunners so we can send them down. That kind of stuff. And if the high threat response team ever actually appears, something really bad has happened and it might end up in a total party wipe because the HTR don't frag around. They will 
use invisibility and mono whips and neuro stun and all the tactics they have to take you down. So I find going up against them in a 1v1 fight isn't actually fun because Shadowrunners will just get plastered and, and dead. Um, so you have them as the boogeyman, as in X amount of minutes, you will die. Get out fast. And you have hardened security, which are, you know, the goons with 12 dice, armored jackets, assault rifles, who, you know, come down as so they shoot. And they're the faster response, but they're the weaker response. Yeah. Well, Elite Guard stuff is usually definitely something that you use quite a bit, and also the looming magical security as well always Ooh. makes people shit themselves. Yeah, so or, you just um, see the colour drain out of the room, and it gets colder as you start to hear, like, the liquid in the fountain form into this Force 10 spirit, and everyone shits their pants. Mm -hmm. Or casually asking the deck what their fire pl firewall plus intuition is and just rolling it behind the dice, you know. <laughs> hey, what's oh, your yeah. firewall plus intuition, man? Just tell me. Uh, cool, thanks, man. Something <laughs> like, hey, guys, what's your perception? <laughs> and if you really yeah. want to be nasty, don't even, like, th there's no decker. You just, what's your firewall and intuition? Okay. Roll that. Oh yeah, red herrings, man. Don't even get me started. They are some of the funnest things to play around with. It's it's the best in horror as well. So, um, well, you can do it in Shadowrun as well because you can run horror-based Shadowrun sessions, and depending on what's happening, you just ask them for perception rolls and tell them you see nothing, that kind of stuff. But this is kind of it's kind of a GM style thing, not really designing a run or anything like that. So, yeah. I mean, that's kind of going on like, that's like the threat of the world itself, but when it comes to actually designing the actual security of the building, at least for me, um, it all comes in mind of kind of what is the building they're going after and me trying to rationalize it. So Shadowrun has this whole like 1 to 6 or 1 to 12 kind of ratio um, of kind of what things are. It's inside the book. I don't have the page, but uh, it basically tells you roughly what all this stuff means. So one being fucking shite, two being Mount you know better, predators. three below average, four average. But it goes one to twelve as well. But that's all based on like anything above eight in terms of like numbers is generally like high fucking security shit, and most players will never have to deal with that unless they're breaking into a triple eight fucking building. But you know, how do you guys gauge that? Because it can be difficult. And as new players, whether or not you even know that exists, that there's this kind of this rating system, you know, and you know. That kind of tied to that is the kind of security that would be around, you know, like um, low-grade hosts probably only have this. They may not even have any ice on them, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, how do you gauge that kind of stuff and balancing it, really? Do you balance it by the party? Do you just put it down and hope that the players don't die? How do you I find it? Shadowrun is a really... Don't throw... Suddenly there's 12 goons. Fight. Um, because that will bog the initiative down and will just slow it down. So mm -hmm. I tend to go, okay, first responders are the guys with armored vests and pistols who are just average show security guards, barely know what they're doing. So that what they're going to do is they're going to go <laughs> in their jazz to make sure that they don't get swiped down by the um, street samurai. They're going to take cover. They're going to stick to the training that's been drilled into them. You, you take cover. You use your... your your pepper spray, you use your smoke bombs, you, you use your gel rounds, and you delay them. And you might have, like, say you've got a party of four, you might throw, say, six average Joe security guards. Say those six security guards just get wiped, just completely murdered. Probably going to happen if you've got, like, a troll with, like, 35 soak and dual-wielding machine guns. That's that's completely fine. Give the guy who has specced into combat the chance to shine and be a combat monster. But yeah. never yeah, never tell them how many goons there are specifically because you can always throw in more if the party yes. has just gone through an entire wave of guys without taking a scratch. In the next room, they've set up an ambush while you were fighting the other guys. Roll surprise as they open fire when you walk into the doorway. Mm, that's this is actually kind of a tip for the players, right? This is a way to get your DM. The more you know, the less he can make up at the at, at, like at a random point. Because 
some players don't realize this, um, but um, GMs make so much random shit on the spot, it is not funny. You know, you do well in a combat, trust me, your next combat is not going to be easy. And there's a reason why that is. So the more that you know, this can kind of piss other GMs off, the less you can fucking fuck around and bullshit. (laughs) So reconnaissance is very important because of this. Not because, it's just knowing, you know, know if that room is empty or filled with fucking trolls, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so like, instead of rushing into it, you could sneak your... uh what are they called? The endoscope around the corner and, and see there's like five guys hiding behind a table and then instead of running in there, you get Jimmy the grenade thrower to throw a grenade in and wipe them out like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's really for the players. Like if you start that, that fight with six players and you know that, for example, the mage hasn't ascensed and he's just going, I'm just going to uh, mind control them all and tell them to kill themselves. Ah, well, one of them's going to attempt to counterspell that. Yeah, because you didn't sense. And I've actually been gotten by that as a GM, where I've forgotten to put in a countermeasure because I told them the wrong thing. But, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, that's a way to get gems, and also that's kind of to tell the gems, always be prepared for everything. But also at the same time, if it doesn't make sense, like a shitty low-grade gang, it is incredibly unlikely that they're going to have a decent mage. So yeah. the magical security is probably going to be none. And that's fine. I, I find the best way to GM out on the fly is go, okay, this is the situation. We have X, Y, and Z. And X is a faction. They're poor in social standing, poor in money, uh, but they have a lot of goons. So they'll react to losing 50 people in certain ways. So if you wipe out an entire team... They might just send a new one in. Um, or if you take out one of the best researchers in the world uh, against a high-threat megacorp, but leave the megacorp's base and they're no longer on your, you're no longer on their turf, the megacorp can't do direct to you because they don't have the control. So I just try and find out what would make sense logically in the world and then do that thing. Yeah, so this is where kind of reading up about law, or at least finding out from someone what should be happening. And this can kind of be restrictive to some GMs, where you have to kind of follow the world so diligently. How do you guys kind of find that, that you have to adhere to the world a lot? Oh, it can be daunting. There is 20 plus years of Shadowrun lore and, and tidbits that you might not know. Like, uh, I can't tell you what happened in the year 2014. 57, but I'm pretty sure something massive happened then. I'm yeah. pretty sure it was Dunkle's arm, now that I Lots recall. Reading and uh, lots of making shit up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, sometimes you have to do that. Um, sometimes you have to tell you the players as well that what you say kind of is final. Like, if they find out something later, it's like, well, that's what I said, and that's how the world is going. And that's happened to me, because at least from my, how I've done my Shadowrun world is that you know, I, I've made mistakes, but I still kept it that way, you know, um, and changed things over time, maybe when I do a new version or a new campaign kind of thing. But stick to your guns. Like, if you make a mistake with the world, like saying, oh, you know, uh, Horizon is a double A, not a triple A, from what I can tell, keep them as a double A. Or maybe they recently turned into a triple A. I don't know. Which, in the world, they actually did about five years ago or whatever. But, yeah, or ten. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, and even then, like, on that note, like, Horizon is a double A. Oh, but they're a triple A in the core rulebook. Then you can go, well, guess what this campaign is going to be about? Doing shadow runs for Horizon to get them to triple A status. And you can do all yeah. kinds of crazy stuff. Except um, this in 2075 for some reason. But whatever, who cares? If you get something wrong, sh- always stick to your guns. Alternate timeline. Um, yeah, not exactly. always. That's sometimes, I mean. yeah, sometimes, like, you might be a bit wrong. And upon, in retrospect, it's like, Hmm, maybe I shouldn't have the team kill Lothweir because that's a bit silly. It depends if it makes the game better. Yes, if yeah. it makes the game better and everyone's cool with it, stick with it. If it's Mate, just I've crashed sort the of internet, that. summoned Krakens, and they have literally fought Triton, you know, the fucking king of Atlantis. Because nice. nice. I'm just crazy and I don't give a shit. Um, entire Aztec cities have risen and they fought inside of its head. Like, just do what you want. 
ultimately, as long as you keep it, you know, one like for me, a big thing that I do is that I have things called artifacts. And artifacts are more or less magical items, but they don't work like foci. And they're not in the book. There's no there's no, no mention of them at all in actual Shadowrun, but I use it all the time. Because in my opinion, magic items aren't magical enough. They might like I think they could be more. So I just do it. And um I call them artifacts instead of foci or whatever, you know, and that's not a Shadowrun thing. But that's something I do and a lot of my players think is true. So sometimes you might have to tell your players whether or not it's actually true to the rules because sometimes I, I home rule things without telling people. But yeah, yeah that's as something long as, you have to manage with your own game. As long as everyone at the table is having fun, it doesn't matter if the semantics are wrong or if it's yeah. too over the top or, you know, that kind of stuff. Because Shadowrun is an mm-hmm. amazing setting. You can be playing Mad Max in one game and then be playing uh, basically James Bond in another. And in another game, you could be finding the secret Atlantis and f- making love to mer people or however you want to go about it. It's huge. The possibilities are almost yeah. endless. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so awesome because there's actually so many unexplored, not unexplored in the world, but unexplored in the books or writing or literature, certain places. Like Australia doesn't actually have that. Like what's going on in Australia in 2075? Who knows? The last thing that was about it was in like, what, 2055 or something, wasn't it? So, uh, you know. Yeah, about that. 2060s. But 2060s. Barely. So that's why not Bob's doing whatever the fuck he wants. And same with Nick in Australia right now. Like, I'm pretty sure we actually made one of the political figures an immortal elf because we thought it was fun. <laughs> yeah, we did that. <laughs> yeah, we did that. Uh, that's Peter great. I've whatever. kept that in mind. Yeah, you make it a thing in your setting and it, we'll, we'll keep keep it going, keep it going. And no one Peter will get Garrett's it apart from us. still dancing to this day. Mm-hmm. He has a club called Mid on All. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have been there. <laughs> All right, so I mean that's kind of like you know, because Shadowrun is a simulationist setting, uh, world and system. So you want to simulate this world, but don't be stuck down in the semantics. And that's what happens in Shadowrun in both rules and the world itself when designing a run. If you do something that's a little bit over the top or a little bit under the top, well, most people don't do it under, but most people do over. Like I've done over several times. My first run, they blew up a double A's fucking home base. Stupid. Ooh, yeah. Should not have happened. We're insane. Big boom. But they did it. <laughs> and I stuck to it. It is in my setting. It has been done. <laughs> but they became wanted as hell. But yeah. <laughs> but that just opens up new storylines and story arcs, and you can have a run, like the entire session, not session, uh, plot becomes avoiding the cops and then, and then clearing your name or changing your face and moving to Namibia for four years and then trying to eke out a living there. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's kind of that, talking about that kind of thing. But um, at least this is kind of an important thing that not just comes up in Shadowrun but everything. And this is I've, I've seen this in Shadowrun quite a bit and also when like doing puzzles and like D&D and stuff. Having more than one ways to solve a problem. Never as a GM go, oh, to get this bit of information, they have to talk to this guy. And only letting them doing it that one way. That is a big no-no. If they've come up with some insane way that kind of makes sense, let them do it. Let the dice fall hmm. as they will. What do you guys kind of have to say to that? Like, or maybe even some stories that you've Never, had where yeah. players have done some strange things that you didn't think about, or you may have had a challenge uh, that only never, had one answer. Never, ever, ever leave um, important plot points behind a dice ball. That yeah. is just setting it up for bad failures. Because there are a couple ways this can go. You beat the dice pool, progress. You fail the dice pool, can't progress, and then the GM goes, hmm, wasn't expecting you to fail that. Um, you progress anyway. Or, C, the plan goes so off rails, maybe they shoot the guy they were meant to talk to uh, that the game literally cannot progress because it was behind that one dice roll, which cannot be reached anymore. So the GM goes, ah, his brother shows up and tells you this information that you need. So put the information, don't center it around one specific dice pool roll. Have it spread out in this massive like map and um, just tweak it a bit conti- like into how they get it. Like, if you call up a contact and say, hey, do you know about Johnny the drug dealer? And, and he goes, yeah, he sold drugs to my brother. The 
he he's he's a sketchy guy. I I want him dead. I'll pay you money. But if you do Google searched him, you'd search his like former alias uh, Johnny the drug dealer, or he used to go to Seattle U, or he's allergic to peanuts, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and yeah. this kind of comes in with the plot convenience as well, uh, when he was talking about, um, sometimes, at least, this was for me when I first started GMing, contacts, because I thought of it logically and went, well, it was unlikely that this random street bum would know what's going on in this area of the Barrens, so I'd say, oh, he knows nothing, but you probably should let the random street bomb know nothing. It, it drives the game forward, ultimately. So, And try to have maybe different bits of information that you're willing to give each contact to make it seem, um, seem meaningful. Because, I mean, contacts is a big part of it. And, Nick, you want to say something? Yeah, if you have um, open-ended information, like stuff that doesn't need to be utterly specific, let the players figure out ways they want to get it and then give them ways they want to get it. So if they've got contacts which they think might be relevant, if they have knowledges they think that might be relevant. If they think they know a place they can go to get it, then um, you know, let them do those things. Mm-hmm. Unless, of yeah. course, you've expressly told them this is the only place. Like, some situations, it's literally you have to go here. Um, this is the only person that knows about this kind of thing. And they're just refusing to, you know. Sometimes you'll have to push them. Like, I've done this in the past where they're trying to call all their contacts. I just go, sadly, you guys call all your contacts, you find nothing. This can be a bit of a cop out, but like especially for um, games online and con games and stuff, it just is faster. So you, sometimes you need to kind of go, okay, guys, sorry, we're just none of your contacts know. It's impossible for, for them to know. Let's move forward. <laughs> yeah, like and, especially for yeah. stuff that would in universe be very specialized. Like your guy connected to the mafia won't know what is happening in Japan at the moment, if that makes sense. Yeah, or it could just be like a government secret or something, and you're doing a mission mm. explicitly about that, and none of your contacts can ever know. And you as a GM sometimes have to you know, rush through things. It can be a bit of a cop-out. People get angry about it, but as, like in, in, say, a home game, probably play it out But um, if you have a decent time to do it. But if you're playing online, especially you say on Runner Hub or in my games, I will just go, no, sorry, it doesn't work. Because mm. it could take, that's uh, one minute compared to half an hour that it could be of talking to all your contacts. So Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the story, uh, I've had a good example of something that the players have figured out from information I just dotted in subtly. So the run was to extract Mr. Johnson from his own corporation so that his corporation would see, oh, you are a valid asset to the team. We'll keep you around because other people want you even though he was dead weight. So Mm -hmm. um, he hired a Shadowrun team, hiding the fact that he was the Johnson, and said, you have to extract a genius computer programmer from Neonet. And then they were like, okay, we can do that. And then they started doing the research, and they found his Instagram, future Instagram feed, and it's just him with a bunch of cats. And you find that he's on the chopping block to get fired, and that he was the sole reason that their recent program sort of crashed and glitched and was a marketing failure. And then the team were like, this guy's not really a genius, is he? Maybe he's, maybe he's the Johnson. <laughs> are, we, are we getting hired to extract him? Is this how it's going to go? And, and they were right. Uh, so I just <laughs> left little clues... Um, to have them an inkling and then put it together instead of, you know, I need you to extract myself from X, Y, Z. Gives, gives it a bit more of the twist, as was uh, said earlier. Also, sometimes the players do the work for you. I've had a very similar circumstance, you know, they're kind of doing a mission, some investigative stuff, and a player says something that is such a good idea and is so fucking awesome, I'm like, you know what, it's going to be that now. Don't be afraid to change your thing. And if you're good enough at thinking on your feet, you know, sometimes the players have better ideas than you do or did when you made the mission. And I've totally I changed mean, things yeah. by going, wow, that sounds awesome. That's exactly what is happening. You don't say it to them, but it just happens to be that because it does two things. The run's better, well, if it's a better idea, and two, it makes that player feel so fucking smart. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I really have really stolen. stolen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's <Don't>, <laughs> like, oh, what do you mean? A oh, hellhound's here. Oh, yeah, I might put hellhounds in there, just, you know, 
pretty cool. Oh, man. Good idea. He's like, man, I hope there's not a mage. My willpower is really low. Oh, sh- fuck, there's a mage. But that's kind of... That is a little bit more cheap, but I'm really talking about when they come up with an idea for like an investigation or what's going on in a government conspiracy. They may have a better idea yeah. than you. <laughs> and don't yeah, maybe this change. guy's like... having an affair. That's why he's at the bar all the time. You originally thought, oh, he's actually an alcoholic, but now the affair can work. Yeah, and that, that, that adds the effect that they can now kidnap the um, mistress instead of him to get leverage on him or something. And that is way more fun than just he's an alco. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Use um, your play you as about this thing? for you. All this kind of thing? Um, I mean, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> um, follow the game. Your players are part of your game, so... Mm-hmm. If they come that's up something, something people that do forget, is cool. that this is cooperative storytelling in a way, and people can get bogged down by the rules. But when you're running and designing a run, be put let there be room for change, because your players may... Like, especially when you're running an online game, with random people and you don't even know what they're playing because in a home game you probably know but online you don't you have to change some shit it's like oh this entire party is non-combat apart from one guy well instead of five troll street sams there's only going to be two because they can handle that a little bit better you know that kind of thing the inverse is also true when you get five street sams that need to talk to one person once and they all have uncouth all have uncouth and just just and then it just ends up with explosions, and, and then Bellevue is on fire, and you're just like, ah, I'm never not taking a face again. So mm-hmm. I took everything that to plan. But also, some of the best runs I have ever had were unbalanced runs. Um, this is less a GM thing as a player thing, but you have to get creative when you don't actually have the necessary tools to get a job done. It is always hilarious trying to watch a group without a hacker or a face trying to infiltrate a corporate building. It is hilarious. <laughs> seeing, the same the funniest shot I've ever seen. seeing the same one shot run with different groups who have who don't have different things. <laughs> mm-hmm. It can be really interesting, but that's kind of just a, a fun thing. Like having an unbalanced group can sometimes be a good thing. I'll tell you right now, because you you have to come up with fucking dumb ideas to get shit done. <laughs> but also, as, as, as a DM, I kind of talked about this before, try not to like be okay with allowing people to do things a little bit differently that you didn't talk about first. You know, like, oh, the face has to trick this guard, but they want to do something different. They want to kidnap him and then torture him. And, you know, just let that happen, you know. Maybe, oh, instead, of, he, he doesn't have a biometric reader that most guards do or something. Like, make it so it would work when maybe normally it wouldn't. Because if that doesn't work, what are they going to do? Nothing. They fail. Like they, you know, some missions I've had to go. Okay, I'm just gonna because you guys don't have a face. I'm gonna either lower his dice, pull, or make it so that it is possible for you to kidnap someone when normally it would be a lot harder. I'm just gonna make it easier, just so you can shit get shit done. You know. Sometimes you can even put that in like as you you give them the information, the stuff they need, and then slap them with the stuff they miss. So say you kidnap the guy who had a biometric reader. Uh, you, you torture him, and they're like, yeah, fine, fine, they're, they're over there. They're just, just leave me alone. And then you hear the beep, 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 beep from his comlink saying, we're coming for you. Hold out a couple more seconds. Don't tell them anything. And, and the team realizes, oh, no, he's being tracked. We've got to get out of here fast. And there's, there's another whole issue arise that they can overcome, but it's not drop hammer, oh, God, we're all dead now. Yeah, but sometimes that kind of situation can be, uh, you know, you have to kind of give leniences and be okay with changing your mission and your run that you have constructed just so your Mm -hmm. players can succeed. Now, if this is, like, I mean, then again, people don't have that same mindset that I, I want my players to succeed ultimately, unless, of course, they're being dickheads. As long as their ideas are good and solid and aren't just stupid, generally it'll go well. Um, but there will always be that curveball. And um, I was kind of talking about before, it's really good to shove that stuff in. And, you know, just don't make it so hard that they can't fail. They, they can't succeed. You know, you just got to be careful of that. And yeah, sometimes like they're kind of if their approach is really stupid, remind them, go, you as a shadow runner think this is a bad idea. If a GM says that to you, you know your idea is bad. <laughs> and as a GM, explain to them why. Like, what is the reasoning behind that? Tell them why. 
oh, the HDR will come and get you. Oh, yeah, don't carry the assault rifle into the club that has a fucking corporate executive in it. Probably a bad idea. <laughs> you know, yeah. anyway. Yeah, you, sh- you should, uh, as a GM, you, uh, there's a lot of temptation to say, like, hide behind the curtain and go, well, this goes does this and this does this and I won't tell you anything until afterwards. But um, sometimes you've got to lift up the curtain and go, hey, guys, um, you probably really shouldn't do that because X, Y, Z will happen, and that will wipe the team. Uh, so keep thinking. Yes, you're, mm-hmm. you may think your dice pool is high, but this guy... <laughs> yeah, like sometimes I might have to go, oh, like, uh, I'll go, oh, this is a rating 8 host, and be like, whoa, scary, and then they go, yeah, that's fine, I can do that. I'm like, by the way, um, a rating 8 host rolls, like, double its host rating, and then plus, like, up to 4. And they're like, oh, maybe I don't want to do that. (laughs) You kind of sometimes have to remind them of rules. Now, people may think the GMs actually try to kill the players, but usually we don't. (laughs) Yeah. That's not what we're there for. uh, GMs, tip, don't go into a game trying to say, how can I kill players today, or how can I burn edge today, or something like that. You want to... the, The burning of the edge and the player death is a part of the story arc that you guys, as a group of storytellers are coming together and writing. So you, the players need to trust you as a GM that you're not just going to go, oh, boom, you're dead for no reason. Because falling over because you had a heart attack for no reason isn't fun. Or getting shot by a sniper rifle that you had no chance of seeing and your character dies isn't fun for anyone. Um, the, the GM might laugh, but Overall, the party is not going to have fun. You got to rebuild a character, and mm. the the death is meaningless. So yeah, well, if you here's something that I've had problems with. If, oh, sorry, Nick, you can go first. You can go first, Nick. If the characters are burning edge and shit. It should be because the dice haven't been in their favor. You should be setting up your game so that they aren't, you know, guaranteed to die in those kind of scenarios. I mean, Except ideally, if they... it's the last session. Just saying, last sessions, everyone's going to be burning edge. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, Depends on how much threat level you want to do. Yeah. Anyway, go on, Nick. Assuming average and all dice, they ought to be getting out, you know, not dead, usually wounded. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Getting by by the skin of your teeth, just surviving and pulling off that run on that adrenaline high of, am I going to die, am I going to live, am I going to die, oh, we made it, is is one of my favorite parts of Shadowrun. And I've, I've... over the last week, I've just been binging on Shadowruns and doing a lot of Pink Mohawk stuff. So they've been in corporate facilities and shooting their way out, and the mage got like knocked unconscious, so they have to drag him back into the car. And by the time they get back to the Johnson, everyone at the table is just going like, that was awesome. Whoa. Didn't think we were going to get out of there. And mm-hmm. yeah, that, that kind of stuff is one of the better feelings of Pink Mohawk, I find. No. Well, here's something that I actually use sometimes with uh, not always the best ending. It's um, insurmountable odds, and that's something that's in Shadowrun quite a bit with the HTR. Now, I've had problems with this, and there is actually, um, in the Mystic Knight series that I did for a bit there, there are a couple episodes where we, they lost. More, they died, and they got captured because they ran into a place with insurmountable odds. I had warned them time and time again, kind of like, you shouldn't go here, this is really scary. And, you know, like when you've got, when I say, oh, there's about ten mages all pointing, um, ready to cast a spell at you, and they ask for something, generally do it. Because as a GM, that's kind of me going, hey, guys, you were always meant to fail this mission. Now, I'm not sure, like, that you see this in movies and TV series a lot, insurmountable odds, and... Is that a good thing to do in, like, a Shadowrun? Like, this is more for a campaign, not so much a one-shot. And this is what the Mystic Knights thing was. It was the campaign, not a one-shot. Is that a good tactic? Or should people... I find insurmountable odds mostly happens when the players bring it on themselves. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's a saying that goes around, you don't need to give them rope. The players will hang themselves. No, no, fuck. I fucked it up. Um... Give them the rope, and the players can hang themselves. And you can say, well, this club is basically a fortress. Everyone here is a mage. They all have guns. Going in here socially, trying to infiltrate, you will die. And if they go, hmm, I 
you find that to be a challenge, I will do it, and you walk in, you're not going to, like, you as a GM have set it up, so th th you shouldn't do that. And if you do that, even despite the in-character and out-of-character warnings, drop the hammer on them. Show them that the world is an uncaring place, yeah. and if you don't pay attention, you will get geeked. Yeah. And that's happened to people many times, where I've kind of gone, the whole club is filled with mages, and they're like, all right, I'm just going to go in there invisible. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's the are thing. You sure how, you do that? how savvy are your players? Are they the kind of people who will resist when you tell them outright, pretty much tell them outright, you know, this is not intended for you to do this. <laughs> this is supposed to be a wall. Yeah, and people get pissed off at invisible walls, and they definitely don't like it in RPGs, but in real life, you can't just walk into the fucking military base and start shooting people. You'll die. Yeah, and it's the same point. in Shadowrun. Yeah, like, you can't you can't just go down downtown with an assault rifle. It's set up so that that's the place. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's a, um, an analog, uh, like, similar sort of stuff that happens in other media. Have you guys played Fallout New Vegas? Yes. Okay, so you know when you wake up in the town and you're told, basically your quest is get to New Vegas and you're told, to the left of you, indestructible monsters, to the, to the, the north of you, death claws and cazadors, to the right of you, just a couple bandits, and to the south of you, don't go there, radiated death trap. Now, most people will like go, okay, I'll go the path of least... I wonder how indestructible those monsters are. And then they find the Great Mother Deathclaw and she slaps some shit. And most people go, hmm, maybe I shan't go there. And they yeah. go the other way. This Media can because... work, but it has to be very like particular about Mate, how it does. I have does. shoot loads of stealth boys. I've done it before, but um, <laughs> yeah, like when I first did it, I had a bunch of stealth boys when I head north and I fucking stealthed the whole way. But... Yeah, that, that one's yeah. a big one, actually. And I kind of felt kind of cheated as a player because on the map, it was you had to loop around the entire map to get to New Vegas. And I was like, that's a bit stupid. I'm going to walk there directly. I was able to do it. I wasted all my fucking ammo, all of my stealth boys, and I was playing a stealth character anyway, and I barely survived. <laughs> but when stupid. you got to New Vegas, wasn't oh, that good. whole, like, holy shit, I did that. That's kind of like the insurmountable odds wall of meat. So... Except in RPGs, you can't go back to a previous save and go, oh, I'm fine again, I'll try that again. It, it's a lot harder. So if everyone in there is a mage, instead of going invisible, you might be able to somehow get inside. If luck is on your side, if your dice pools are hot, if you're playing to the best of your abilities, and you somehow manage to pull it off, yeah, as a GM, let them have that victory if every single thing is perfect. Mm. But if if that one little factor is wrong, don't be afraid to drop the hammer. If if they're blatantly just going, I want to do this hard for hardness sake because lol jokes. Yeah. As this happened before, I remember one time, um, they they wanted to find out something and the thing that was kind of hidden that was like masquerading a whole bunch of stuff that was actually happening in the background of a mission after they'd finished it, they had to go through a military rating 10 host of the government or some shit and they fucking did it and they survived somehow and I had put black ice in it and shit and it was rating 10, it was rolling like fucking 22 dice to its fucking resistance checks and they rolled insanely with initial edge and they were actually able to do it and you know don't be okay if that happens, and it can kind of cheat you out because, you know, what if you are making a, um, a campaign, right? There's not just one run, and this is something that's actually hiding information that they're not allowed to get right now. What do you do? Do you let them go past the rating 10 host, even though they did actually do it with their dice ball, and let them get that information? Or that information isn't there anymore and there's something else? What would you guys do in that situation? Especially if it's like a conspiracy investigation-based campaign. Hmm. I would give them the information uh, because they've done something crazy, but by doing something crazy, they probably have repercussions. So mm -hmm. maybe they got traced while in there, but they managed to get out just in time. So they're going to have to move cities and lay low because suddenly corporate black bag teams are just kicking down their doors and swats everywhere. So, you know, change it up. Don't be 
afraid to change the shift of your campaign if it makes sense in character uh, and out of character. If everyone's having fun with the whole who's really who and like conspiracy kind of stuff, you can have that super secret conspiracy stuff, but maybe it's only a tiny little segment of the pie of the real conspiracy. Layers upon layers of dragonic, draconic intrigue and mega corporate tactics and all that kind of stuff. Maybe you only have one side of the story from the military. Perhaps Ares knows all about this Chicago thing that's happening. Yeah, if, if the players you know, make up that plan and execute something that you weren't expecting them to do and it messes up your plans for the campaign, then probably best to roll it because it feels really great when you do something special like that and, you know, the campaign starts to revolve around the stuff that your characters do and, you know, yeah. it, becomes a, it becomes part of the rolling narrative. Your characters are part yeah. of the story. This is quite recently when a, a group of players um, went to a place, they, they took out an area, right, and this was meant to be their hangout. It was in the Barrens. And um, the, the whole thing is that the Halloweeners then came up later and they were like, hey, you guys need to pay board, basically. You know, it, it was basically the equivalent of them paying rent was them to pay the Halloweeners for protection. They fucking fired on them and attacked them. I was like, what the fuck? That was not what you were meant to do. Holy shit, guys. That was just for board. Like, that was just to cover money. That was just meant to be a discrepancy. So it wasn't for free. And I was like, you guys have just angered the entirety of the Halloweeners. Sent a whole nother air, like massive group of people to do it again. And they fucking killed them with insurmountable odds. So at this point, I'm like, they've just angered the entirety of the Halloweeners. But then they hook off this insane plan. And they're actually able to systematically shut down multiple bases and stuff like that. And I'm like, they're successfully taking out a gang right now. Like, this is a big gang, but they're doing the right things. They're staying out of trouble, and they're doing it all right. And that's what the whole campaign became about all of a sudden. That's not what it was meant to be. But it became all about killing the Halloweeners. Eventually, the Halloweeners and them had a truce, and they became like a massive mega gang. <laughs> but that's what happened. It wasn't meant to be like that. But Yeah, no, that sounds happened. fucking cool, though. And that's mm -hmm. what you as a GM and a player is meant to do. It's an emerging storyline with stuff like that changes. If if a GM wants to tell a story on Rails, write a novel and then tell it to your players. If a GM wants to roleplay, have the players' actions impact the world in positive and negative ways and see that change in the world and guide the narrative alongside what the players do. Also, shout out for Bluey for doing that, by the way. That was Bluey that did that. But, yeah, Bluey playing a face. It, it doesn't end well. Um, anyway, um, I think that we pretty much talked about anything else in terms of all this designing runs. It's less about designing runs, just really talking about the GM mindset. Um, is there anything else you guys want to say, talk about, any topics or anything like that? Because we've covered everything, at least from my end. Depend on your players to know their stuff. Like, if you're starting out as a, uh, a GM, you probably don't have a good grasp on literally every single bit of the rule. So, tell your hacker, study the matrix bit, and I'll read the matrix bit, and then you tell me what to do, and we'll do it. And you tell the mage, oh. Sorry, do this. There. Oh, yeah, Don't run certain parts for a while. Maybe yes. have a few up sessions where you go, guys. I don't want to run decking or magic. Can we do a non-magic, or at least non? Like you can be an adept, but you know, can we? Uh, like the enemies won't have magic for a while, and there's going to be no decking. You can be a decker or a mage if you want, but you have to know it all. Mm -hmm. And just tell your players. Um, I've had plenty of people that have been new to GMing say, oh, like I've told them, just maybe don't run decking for a while. I remember when I first started with fifth edition, I was so keen to run, I didn't even know decking when I ran. And none of my players were deckers anyway, so that was good. I told them not to. I was like, don't, don't do decking. I don't even know how it works. <laughs> so, because I was so keen to run. Like, I knew magic, but I just didn't know decking at the time. I was like, just don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll just play. And that worked. Just, yeah. you know, put out the parameters. Anyway, continue. Yeah, Sorry for running in. You're a DM, so you can, you can set rules. <laughs> you can ask your players, you know, not make a character who can roll 30 dice for one gun and then not really do anything else. <laughs> Yes, that's very important. Remember when set, starting a campaign and when doing anything really, make sure everyone is on the same page and communication is working well. Good communication, uh, communication can make or break a game, especially miscommunication. 
So if you as the GM have a certain image of what's happening in mind and the player has a different expectation or image of what's happening or what will happen in mind and they clash, this can often lead to arguments, bad role-playing, accusations of being that guy, that kind of stuff that you see horror stories about that were probably someone misunderstood someone and it just went downhill because no one you know, sat down, talked about playing imaginary friends like adults and made sure everyone was cool with what was happening. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Um, I think that's it. This has been uh, pretty uh, pretty good. Some... Oh, Nick, I guess, do you have any closing statements? Um, no, not particularly, but um, actually, the thing about Shadowrun, yeah, it's really, really rules-heavy, and oftentimes you'll you will be stumped with what the hell is going on, and you really don't want to be stuck, you know, searching through, like, 400 pages looking for the one thing. So don't be afraid to just wing it if you have yeah. no idea what's going on, like you think... Uh, so it's- yeah, so something that I do, um, because uh, Shadowrun generally people split up, right? When a rules question comes into play, I go, all right, so instead of you looking up the rule, Mr. Decker, who's the Decker right now, we're just going to call this, but Face, who's doing nothing right now, can you please look through the rule book? Now, some people don't really like doing this, but I do. But like Searching up rules during the game, don't do it if it actually bogs down the game. But someone's doing nothing, which in Shadowrun is a lot of the time during legwork. Just let them do something, you know, look through the rules, and then you go, oh, the rule's actually that. All right, from now on, we'll do that. But, yeah. yeah. You, you can also say, make a ruling on the spot, reread the rule book yeah, exactly. afterwards, and then remember it next time. That s- speeds up a lot of stuff. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, um, either way, um, I love uh, uh, GMing Shadowrun, and Shadowrun is uh, freaking amazing for that. It may seem overly complicated and overwhelming, but it's it really so not worth it. Can- like, once you get into the mindset as a Shadowrun GM, I can just literally GM whenever. Like, at least that's me as an improvisational GM. I can GM at any time. Like, I can GM right now if need be, but I'm not going to. But, you know, once you get into the mindset of how the corporations think, how a gang thinks, maybe stick with one at the start. Do a corporate campaign, do a gang campaign, which is usually what happens anyway. Oh, and they are so stick fun. With mindsets. Which one, gangs or corporate? Both, just like sticking around a sit, because Shadowrun is so huge. Like there are ten big ten megacorps, and then you've got double A megacorps, and you've got gangs, and you can just like a lot of the time GMs just go, I want all of it. I want to do this and this and this. Sometimes it's finding a central core bit. Like maybe you guys are all company men who work for Wuxing, and you're just going to do a bunch of runs for Wuxing and follow a certain theme. That stuff can be really cool when done right and you get to like mm-hmm. focus a lot that you don't usually get that might just be me rambling about how much I love specific focus and character development ah delicious yeah well one of my biggest campaigns well not my biggest but one that I did recently <clears throat> that was fairly successful was that everyone was to play a character that has been burnt they have nothing, and then they get picked up by this mysterious Johnson who literally gives them everything that they want. It fucking ends with them finding out that he's a dragon who's trying to, who is a human, he's a dragon trapped in a human's body that's, who's literally more the most powerful dragon ever, and it ends up with him getting fucking Thor shotted. It was an insanely awesome campaign, but <laughs> that's the kind of thing, you know, like. Having themes, I think, allows for campaigns to go longer and have more reach, and it does restrict character creation, and that gets some people fucking grumpy. But in my opinion, I'd rather have a flavorful character that fits with what's going on and my group than just have Joe Blow with a fucking rifle. But that's my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, just if you're sure. running a corp game, and, and he's like, well, I used to be a ganger, and you go, no, you wouldn't have gotten past the second round of interviews. Maybe change it up a bit. Or you can try to make that work. Maybe you did be become a part of a gang and you got hacked into the system and they don't know that you were in a gang. Or maybe you're, you're, you're like keep ganging on the side and, and like no one knows yeah. about it. It's a double life. Yeah, you can, That's you can the GMs work don't that out. Say no to certain character things. Always try to make it work. Sometimes yeah. you have to say no, but explain to the player why. And if the player disputes you and actually has a pretty good idea, accept it. Don't be fucking grumpy and like, no, 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 it has to be this. But I mean, I've, I've done that before, but, you know, just talk to your players. That if, you want to, you know, if you want to set those rules, you do them in advance. Like, if you're saying, you're character character in this game, you tell them if you got anything oh my to God. do. 
character We're creation settings are amazing. Yeah. You need them 100%. Everyone needs to be there on the same page. Get everyone together so you don't have, well, I'm a cat girl infiltrator with 21 dice, and I'm a decker who doesn't have a deck yet and six dice and hacking. You know, <laughs> make, make sure everyone is together and knows what they're doing, power levels, themes, backstories, intertwine that shit. Makes it so much better. Mm-hmm. Alright, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I've had a great time talking. Maybe we'll do more of this in the future. I don't know. Um, hopefully some sessions will be up in the near future. Either way, hope you guys had fun. Hope you guys had fun watches. We've had a few viewers um, during this, so hope you guys had fun watching. Um, and, yeah, that's myself. And, Bob, do you have anything else you want to say? Shadowrun as a system is one of the most difficult I've ever done, but once you take to it and understand how to play it and how the world works, it is one of the most satisfying experiences I've ever had in a role-playing game just because of how deep and uh, like effective you can get into the storytelling and mechanics. If you want to just roll dice at things, you can do that. It is and broad, I'm, and I and want I'm, more GMs to love it. So get inspired, yo. And how lethal and spontaneous it is. It is mm-hmm. such a lethal and spontaneous system. <laughs> Oh, I love the lethality and the spontaneity. spontaneity. So All right. Good. So uh, that is uh, from something about tabletop and our little, I guess, uh, I don't know, whatever the word is for, I don't know, a discussion panel. There we go. I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed watching it and my, myself uh, tripping over my own words. Um, and see you later and good night or good day or whatever time it is. Goodbye.